contacted by the Hammond Police Department, and they took me to a house, and they said that they uh, had a suspect, and they had several missing children in the, in the area, missing boys in the area, and they wanted to know if my dog could uh, go into the basement of this house and conduct a search for him. Sometimes people have a difficult start in life, which can lead to it affecting them later on. And the worst kinds of trauma can create some monsters. In this disturbing case, we are about to dig into someone who had a difficult, to say the least, home life, which created a disturbed individual who was a major threat to teenage boys for nearly 30 years. But is he still out there? December 9, 2003. A creepy basement located in Hammond, Indiana was investigated after several local teenagers had gone missing. At the time police had narrowed down their suspect, however, the bodies of the teenagers couldn't be found and they had no clue where to start. The police thought the bodies were buried under the basement, but it would be difficult to dig it out. Instead, they brought in a cadaver dog. These dogs are specially trained to sense the smell of human remains and alert people. The dog, a large pup named Ammo and his partner, a K-9 detective named Dale Bach were sent down into the dark, eerie basement. Dale put the dog in the basement and gave him the command to search the area. He went to the far corner of the house that stood still and just barked which was odd as he was trained to dig in the spot when he sniffed out a body. This led Dale to be confused so they had the cops dig there. A week later they were called back to the creepy basement by the cops and began to drill into the concrete in various areas. Nothing was found. They still needed Ammo's powerful sniffing abilities to solve the crime. This time, Ammo did what he had been trained to do. He started scratching and digging in the southwest corner of the basement, where a hole had been drilled. The cops are supposed to film this occurrence, and as they didn't, Dale had asked for a second tape. After they got the equipment ready, they asked Ammo to go back however, this time Ammo went to a different hole so they had to dig up two spots with the possibility of finding human remains. Just to take extra precautions, the cops had also called in concrete experts. It had been confirmed that there had been excess concrete used which made this search more suspicious. Cops also called in forensics and an entomologist, which is someone who studies insects and knows specific bugs which are found around the deceased. Combining these specialists, they quickly realized there was something worth investigating in the basement. After more digging, they sent Ammo down there for a third time, who quickly gave his sign when he has sniffed out something. Terrifyingly, they found a human leg wrapped in a plastic bag. This amplified the search and they started to dig more, finding two bodies and then a third on the other side of the basement. However, this was a little different. The third body had been wrapped in a blue lead paint before it was wrapped in plastic. More gruesome things had happened to this individual. Too graphic for me to mention but it also included a pole which was used in a way you would not want to imagine. Ultimately, a horrendous crime had been committed leading to three victims, who were Nicholas. James, 19, James Rangnell, 16, and Michael Dennis, 13. The victims were really young. But who was behind this awful discovery? The cops already had a suspect. Someone who had been renting out the property. He was David Edward Most. Eventually, he would be known as Crazy Dave. And you will see why. What's really disturbing about this case is what happened to the three teenagers could have been prevented. So who was David Edward Most? Born in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. Back in 1954. He had a difficult childhood too. His father, George Moss, left him when he was only seven after divorcing his mother, Eva. So David was left with his mom and his younger brother. However, she had her own major mental health problems and unable to cope she dumped him in a mental institution when he was only nine years old and hardly visited him. But this was probably for the best as she was not in any state to look after anybody. Before this his mother claimed he set fire to his younger brother's bed, and later tried to drown him, but this is not confirmed. If David was strange when he got confined, he was even worse when he was moved to a children's home at the age of 13, where he experienced more trauma. Few years on, he began working a construction job with his uncle. This didn't last long after he crashed the company truck and was fired. 
At this point, his mom lived in Chicago, where he tried to move back to and live with her however she threatened him with a blade and forced him to leave. At her suggestion, Most enlisted in the U.S. Army and was transferred to Germany in 1972. He was an army cook during his time and was apparently doing well on that job however, deep inside of him was a monster lurking waiting to burst out. A while later, Most was convicted by a military court of involuntary manslaughter of 13-year-old, James McClister's death and sentenced to four years of hard labor in the military prison in Leavenworth, Kansas Most refused parole consideration. The victim's mom, of course, was furious with the sentence he was given. When David got released back into the real world, he struggled to keep out of trouble. In 1979, he plead guilty but was acquitted from stabbing a housemaid. A decade later he was back behind bars, serving half of his 35-year prison sentence for killing a 15-year-old boy, Elgin Jones, in 1981. Weirdly, in David's file, there was warning notes which read bad guy Gacy type. The notorious clown killer, who they even have a Netflix show about. This just showed that the cops knew what he was capable of. But even more odd, David Moss himself knew he shouldn't have been let out when he first spent time away. In his diary stating, when I got locked up in the army, and then especially when I got locked up in 1981, I knew I should never be let out again. I didn't know how to act around other people and I was never taught how to make friends and keep them. When an inmate says he doesn't want out, I hope that somebody listens. Written in October, 2005. David had written a five-page letter to the authorities to not let him out, but it wasn't listened to. Ultimately, this must still haunt the corrections department as they later found the three teenage bodies in the creepy basement in Hammond, Indiana. Even though David had spent just under 20 years in prisons at mental health institutions, he was free in 1999, serving half his sentence due to good behavior. The law has now been changed and the most serious offenders now have to serve 85% of their sentence. But what made him so dangerous? Due to his challenging, awful childhood led him to have severe trauma through his younger years leading him to very early on offend. In court, David's defense team presented a 66-page document, highlighting how he became so dangerous and how all the triggers in his mindset set David down a very dark and disturbing path. His mother was described as disturbed, psychotic, and narcissistic. The signs were portrayed early on. His younger brother Jeffrey Most had seen him brutally take the life of a little helpless squirrel with a baseball bat just to see how it felt. Also, as mentioned earlier, he had also attacked his brother twice, nearly killing him both times. This may have been the reason his mom had sent him away early on. Both his mom and brother had advised for him to get the death penalty. Oddly, David even wanted that himself, which is sad. Fast forward to December 2005. David pled guilty and escaped the death penalty again. He was given three consecutive life sentences for the discovery of the three boys found in the basement. The victims' families didn't have long to process this as in 2006, the convicted killer had used a twisted bedsheet and took his own life. It took him 27 long hours for him to pass away. After his mom stated, I never hated David, I'm so sorry he killed himself, it made me see that I loved David more than I ever knew. He left a note before he took his own life, confessing to everything and apologizing to the victim's families. David Most had also convinced authorities to make a register for his type of crimes. In 2011, a new Indiana code stated that sex or violent offenders must register with law enforcement authority to include a person convicted of murder. If this was reinstated before, this could have been stopped. But the victim's families could now only carry on with their lives. Thanks for watching, and comment below of a case you would like me to cover.